All for you, Damien. All for you. Isn't that a Janet Jackson song? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. Yes, yes, more. And Big Anklevich. Yes. Cheers, guys. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Totally. This is Rish Outfield, man. Yes, welcome. Big Anklevich here. And uh, this is episode 157. Well, 157, that blows my mind, yeah, man. That's totally gnarly, right? Oh, oh, righteous. Anyways, we've got a great story for you today. Clay Duggar is back with another story for us. Oh, the righteous dude. That's right. He is a totally righteous dude. He's been on the show before. He's a longtime listener. And, and this is another one of our triple word score contests stories so this one's called surfer dudes from outer space oh well then we've been doing the wrong voice all this time i i didn't realize it was a serious story <laughs> um, uh so i guess we're just gonna jump right into it let me see if we've got an about the author about the author Clay Duggar is the mild-mannered secret identity of the podcast cowboy, riding the ranges of geek fandom and the never-ending quest for the best in geek culture interviews. The podcast cowboy stops at nothing to talk to <clears throat> the artists that inspire us all. When not doing that, he sometimes writes. He shares his San Antonio, Texas lair with his wife and their cat, Sparky, around whom the universe revolves. Check out the link in the show notes to hear his interviews from his podcast, The Concast. Uh, we'll just jump into the story. Hang 10. Cowabunga, man. Oh, it's a Ninja Turtle story now, huh? Oh, is it? Was it? <laughs> <laughs> or a Bart Simpson story. <laughs> All right, we'll see you later, folks. Enjoy the show. Surfer Dudes from Outer Space by Clay Duggar Brody woke up. The surf hushed quietly outside his window. What had... Whoa. Oh, there it was. A nasally voice pierced the night, obliterating the peaceful ocean sounds. That was so gnarly, dude! The responding voice was raspy, like someone who had spent the day screaming at a ball game. I know! That was awesome! Both were familiar somehow. The two men kept whooping and hollering, going on about the apparently excellent surfing they had just experienced. Brody got out of bed and looked out over the second floor deck. He spotted the campfire immediately. It was directly between his window and the ocean. The ocean was calm, and had been all day. Brody had hoped to get in some time on his board, but it wasn't happening here. He would have had to travel several hours to get any good waves. He missed surfing. That's why he rented this beach house. He hadn't surfed since moving to Vegas. And these two weeks were supposed to be spent building up those calluses again. Oh well, he thought. I've only been here a day and a half. I'll run down the coast tomorrow and catch some board time. If I can get any sleep, that is. He put on a pair of loose shorts and stepped out onto the deck. Dudes! He called. Take it down the way some, can ya? I'm trying to get some sleep. Besides, this is a private beach. He couldn't see the two very well. Their fire was very low. And... green? There were no lights on this stretch of the beach. It was supposed to be a private beach for a hundred yards in either direction. He could smell something fruity. It wasn't pot, but it wasn't wood smoke either. A figure he couldn't make out stood, and he heard the nasally voice. The cliché of the speech was almost laughable. Oh, dude, we're sorry. We didn't know this was your beach. 
We just came ashore here and collapsed. The other one spoke without standing. Sure, we're beat, man. Been on the boards for like the whole day, dude. From the deck, the two didn't look right to Brody. The shadows from the moon and the low fire made them look like giant slugs. Maybe they were just fat. The first one gestured. Hey, dude, you surf? Come on down, man. It'll be way cool to visit with a native surfer. Get some hints on local style, find out where the best currents are, you know, just chill and stuff. Sighing, Brody waved with his right hand and a fist with a thumb and the pinky finger stuck out, the thumb pointing up. The shaka was an all-around hand signal for surfers. It meant anything you wanted it to, although it usually just meant hang loose. In this case, it meant, hang loose, dudes, I'll be down in a moment. The first surfer yelled out, Oh, dude! Brody grabbed a couple of six packs of beer on the way out. Why not? He missed surfers almost as much as he missed surfing. The community was strong, even among strangers. These two were harmless. Besides, what better way to vacation than lay around the beach, too late at night, drinking cold beer and shooting the shit about waves you've ridden? When he stepped outside, the motion sensor on the security light clicked above his head and the bright floodlights lit the way to the surf. Brody stopped, squinting his eyes. The sudden light ruined his ability to see the beach. The two guys by the fire looked way too overweight to surf worth a damn. The one still lying down looked like a small beached whale. There were two boards stuck nose down in the sand though. They were much longer and wider than his board but were probably a new brand he didn't recognize. The boards were also pearlescent, the colors rippling even through Brody's blinded sight. The standing figure waved his arm floppily over his head. Dude, sweet! Damn, if that voice wasn't familiar to Brody. He could just about see a short blonde guy with white sunscreen kicked on his nose, eating pizza. And that other voice, he knew that voice too. Were they old surfing buddies? Did they track him down to relive the good old days? Oh well, doesn't matter, he thought. It'll be fun. As he walked toward the green fire, the wind shifted, blowing the smoke directly in his face. That was the fruity smell. Whatever they were burning, it wasn't exactly wood. The smoke burned his eyes a little, but it didn't last more than a couple seconds. When they cleared, he noticed that he had been very wrong in his estimated size of the two guys. One actually was a short blonde guy, although he had no sunscreen on his nose. The other was much taller, a little over six feet, with long, shaggy gray hair. Brody stopped dead in his tracks. He almost dropped the beer from both hands. Not only did he recognize the voices, he recognized the faces. Dude, you all right? Jeff Spicoli from Fast Times at Ridgemont High asked. Yeah, man, you look like you saw a ghost. Dr. Emmett Brown from Back to the Future added. Brody barely managed a... Um, you look, uh, you're... uh, uh. We look just like someone you know, right, dude? Yeah, that's the glom. It has that effect, Spicoli said, nodding his head deeply. Um, glom? Brody asked. Doc Brown spoke up. Yeah, glom. It's a hallucin... hallucin... It makes you see things, dude. It makes people see other people like they sound. Keeps people from freaking out every time we go surfing. Hallucinogen? You drugged me? Brody did drop the beer with this. I can't believe this. Dude, chill. Just relax. It ain't no big deal, Spicoli said. No big deal? Dude, I get tested at work all the freaking time. They'll can my ass if I pee positive. Spicoli laughed. Nah, dude. They don't test for glom. It doesn't exist on Earth. They can't test for it. Besides, Doc Brown added. It doesn't stay with you. 
As soon as you get away from the smoke, it's gone, man. Poof, it just goes away. Something the Spicoli surfer said stuck in Brody's mind. You said Glom doesn't exist on Earth, right? Spicoli nodded with his entire upper torso. Yeah, dude. We're not, uh, local, if you get my drift. Not local, Brody said. As in, not from here? You got it, man, said Doc Brown. We're from out there. He pointed straight up. Spicoli pointed also, but at an angle. Actually, uh, from up there. The Andromeda Galaxy? Yeah, he's not too good at directions. Dude! Doc Brown jumped to his feet. I just caught it! You totally look like Clargant! Whoa! Heavy! Oh, righteous! Spicoli yelled. You do! You look just like Clargant! Oh, man, this rocks! I, I, I'm sorry, who? Brody asked. He heard them, but they couldn't have said what he thought. Shia Glargant, dude! Doc Brown exclaimed happily. Only the greatest movie hero in the world! Well, our world! He flies around helping dudes, saving them, all that stuff! When he isn't doing that, he's Glargant, mild-mannered taxi driver! Dude, this is awesome! Wait till Dad gets here, he's Glargant's biggest fan! He's, he's got, like, all the movies, dude! Spicoli looked at the sky. Yeah, dude. Where is Dad? He was supposed to be here a while ago. Everest couldn't have taken him that long. Brody held up his hands. Whoa, oh, dudes, just, whoa. You're from another galaxy and have a superhero who has a secret identity with the name Clark Kent. <laughs> All right, th this joke has gone on long enough. And really, Everest, as in Mount Everest, your dad climbed Mount Everest. Spicoli looked proud. Yeah. Dad free climbs all over the Milky Way, dude. Everest is his warm up. Your dad free climbs Everest to warm up. Warm up for what? Whatever's next, dude. Duh, said Spicoli. We're going to the galactic core from here. Dad's gonna free climb a crashing moon while Flume and I surf an ammonia ocean on a planet about to enter a black hole. Event, Event horizon. horizon! They both yelled, giving each other the shock a hand sign. Yeah, okay, joke's over. Keep the beer. You earned it. I'm gonna go back to bed. Brody said as he turned. Spicoli spoke. Dude, the wind is shifting. Chill for a moment. Brody turned back just as the wind did indeed shift. The smoke drifted away to his right, and he immediately fell back on his butt. Spicoli slowly melted. He became a large, slug-like thing with several tentacles. Brody looked over at Doc Brown, or Flume, as he had been called. He, too, was a slug, but much larger. One of his tentacles looked torn. He pointed at Flume, but couldn't speak. Flume looked down at the torn tentacle. Oh yeah, man, that shark was gnarly. Almost got my board. Righteous, Spicoli said. Sweet, Flume responded. Spicoli jumped, or twitched, or something. Dude, you could totally come with us. That would be epic. Flume did the same whatever that Spicoli did. Awesome! The three of us, surfing the ammonia ocean, the black hole trying to suck us all to oblivion! That would rock! The wind gusted back toward Brody, and the two melted back into Jeff Spicoli and Dr. Emmett Brown. Brody shook his head, trying to clear it. Ah, uh, dudes, I, uh, can't surf in ammonia. Spicoli laughed. You totally could. We got everything you need to live anywhere, dude. Flume spoke up. Yeah, you think we could surf here if we didn't? The ocean would just, like, dissolve us, man. Spicoli looked skyward again. Where is Dad, dude? 
Did he forget where Australia was again? Flume looked around the sky. To know, man, maybe. Brody said, Australia? Dudes, you're not in Australia. This is California. Spicoli looked aghast. California? Dude, Flume, you doofus. Flume said, It must have been that shark. Got me all turned around and stuff. We'd better get going. Dad's gonna be pissed. No sooner had Flume spoke than there came from the sky a loud roar, accompanied by a lot of rattling and smoke. Something resembling a vehicle landed on the sand. Really? Brody asked, gesturing with his hand. Your spaceship is a surfer van. Shia? What else, dude? Spicoli replied. The side of the spaceship slid open, and a tall, muscular figure stepped out. Yo, dudes. Why, why do I gotta come looking for you all the time? Australia, not California. You know I hate this place. Brody's jaw dropped. He looked at Spicoli. He looked at Doc Brown. He looked back at Sylvester Stallone. Five minutes. Don't leave without me. He yelled over his shoulder. He was returning to the house at a dead run, the beer forgotten. Stallone watched the running man. Was that Glock Gant? Man, I love that dude. Okay, so uh, before the story, you didn't tell people what the uh, the rules of the triple word score story were, and I'm I'm starting to worry that uh, after a dozen or so of these stories, nobody's going to want to hear what the rules of the triple word score story were. But go ahead and do it, would you? Okay, you got three random words that you had to. Uh use in your story they were basically supposed to be the basis of your story so clay's we didn't tell you what his three words were because we didn't want to give you know his big reveal at the end of his story away but now that we've gotten this far it's time clay's three words were hallucinogen andromeda galaxy and sylvester stallone and it seemed like he probably had a, a tough row to hoe with those words. I mean, just giving him Sylvester Stallone, that makes it kind of difficult. How do you work Sylvester Stallone into a story? And a couple of people got words like that. I know that Michael Jackson is coming up down the line. Somebody got that as their word. And Algar Van Kluth got uh, butt plug, pencil sharpener, and Avril Lavigne, which... Again, that's a tough one. How do you work Avril Lavigne into your story? How do you work butt plug into your story? <laughs> yeah, somebody has George Lucas on their list as well. Yeah, that's that's just got to be tough. I'm glad I didn't get that because uh, that would have sucked. But anyways, uh, instead of doing the regular author's note that we do with our usual stories, instead we have triple word score of, of questions. Three questions that we ask each author. So we'll do that again. Rish can ask me the questions and I'll pretend to be Clay answering them. Should I do it in a surfer accent or should I do it in a cowboy accent says Clay's from San Antonio? Well, if he's from San Antonio, then he knows what pecani sauce is supposed to taste like. That's right. All right. So I'm going to ask this question of fake Clay Dugga. Was this a fun contest for you? Is writing generally fun to do anyway? How did the rules of this contest make it more or less enjoyable for you? A resounding yes. I had a blast writing this story. After the initial, oh shit, really? moment, I ran with it. Writing is fun for me on those rare times that I get to write. And this story was more so. All right, I, I got to interrupt you. You say squeal like a pig. Squeal like a pig. 
Can we play the, the deliverance music in the background? <laughs> um, I, dude, it's too ridiculous. To too ridiculous? Come on, it can't be worse than the Australian accent that I did last time. Just upshift to an American accent. The author uh, disowned us, despite having been a fan of our show since before it began. Mm. He said he would never listen again after I did that Australian accent. All right. The rules were fine. I'm a sprinter, so can I can I do the surfer one then? The rules were fine. I'm a sprinter, so the short length was perfect. I don't normally write anything comedic, but this story got me going. So I've written another one that's supposed to be funny. Who knows if it really is, though? I'll never find out. Because now I'm a zombie. I'm choosing my side. Are you going to ask the second question? Oh no, it's too awful to hear you do that. <laughs> then you should make me stop. Okay. Question number two. Could you please speak in a normal voice? Oh, okay. Question number three. You were given three words at random. How much impact did the three words have on the finished product? How did you decide in what way to use the words? The words led almost directly to the story, in my case. Hallucinogen made me automatically think of Spicoli. Don't know why but he's the classic drug dude in my mind. Spicoli led to surfing. Add Andromeda Galaxy to surfing, and there you go. Doc Brown, actually Ignatowski from Taxi, but I deemed it too obscure this many years later, seemed like a perfect fit. Once I had the drug-induced characters, Stallone was easy. Plus, Stallone did Cliffhanger. Get it? Mountain climbing? Ha! I don't get it. Question four. Who is your favorite doctor? Duh. Tom Baker. As if you have to ask. Although I am a little partial to John Pertwee. Did I, did I say that right? You did. That's a weird name. Say thanks to everybody. Thanks to everybody. Oh, you're, well, you're welcome, sir. How, so are I, you just going to speak for everybody now, huh? Is that how this goes? Well, you know. You become that megalomaniacal, that in love with yourself, that you're going to speak for everybody. I see. Well, I... well, thank you, Clay, for writing us a good story. Clay has uh, been on the show before as a voice. But he was on the show with his story Sides, the zombie story. Was uh, w Did he ever do another story? He has never, ever done another No, he, he didn't do another story on our show. But I'm sure he's done another story. But maybe he hasn't. I don't know. Good night, everybody. Drive safe. And tip your waitresses. So you uh, recently said in a text that you sent to me. Uh-oh. That this was perhaps one of the funnest experiences you've had putting together a story in a long time. Well, yeah, I, I think part of it is just how short the stories are. It's really easy to burn yourself out when you've got 45 minutes to an hour ahead of you. But these are small. And uh, first I just uh, I, I cut out all of our bull crap, And then I laid surf sounds underneath it. And, uh, yeah, but I had fun, like, making spaceship noises and uh, with the, the – I guess we were supposed to um, – what do you say? Acknowledge the Kevin McLeod music from Incompetech.com. Okay. You found yourself a good uh, reggae music from uh, Incompetech? Yeah, they, they, that guy. You, you've worked with his stuff before. Mm -hmm. There's just hundreds and hundreds of little tracks and – I wanted there to be like a surfing song kind of thing. And there there wasn't a category for that, but there was a reggae category. And I listened to two or three. And as soon as I heard that noise that you hear at the very beginning of the story, I was like, that's the one I'm using. Righteous. And uh, you went, oh, gnarly. I did. This is the perfect song for this. I don't know. I just, it was a fun story and, uh, and it was fun to put together. And plus, was there a reason why it's just you and me? I don't know if there was a reason for that. I think we wanted to do particular voices. I think I was down to do the Spicoli. 
Although at one point there was some guy like my my son watches these Minecraft videos all the time because he loves Minecraft, and he was watching a Minecraft video in the uh, other room while I was working on something in here, and I heard one of the characters. He's like, "Hey, player dude, you gotta build a shelter," and I was like, "Whoa." I should get that guy to do the Spicoli voice for our show. And I even contacted the dude, but he didn't ever get back to me. So, Because apparently that Minecraft game sucks you in. Yeah, it might be. It might be that he was sucked all the way down into the mine and was never able to come back out. Unfortunately, he was not interested, I guess, in doing a voice for our show. But uh, I thought I did a passable job as a surfer dude i don't know if i sounded a whole lot like spicoli but i haven't watched fast times at richmond high enough to really be able to do a an impression and i'm not really good at doing impressions when it comes down to it either but i wanted to do that i thought it was fun and i think you you've done doc brown many times so it seemed like that was kind of a uh, natural yeah, Stallone was the hard one, but he only had two lines, and so no big deal. He didn't particularly sound like Stallone, but that's that's okay. Well, you liked your Stallone enough to do it on the uh, Oh, the Places We'll Go. Yeah, and I think it had gotten better in All the Places You'll Go. It, it's just a voice I hadn't done before. and uh... Now you have. If you want to see Oh, the Places You'll Go... You could check it out. I'll put a link on it. Yeah, it was uh, one of our little kind of incentive things that we sent out to all the folks who donated. But now, yeah, you can go check it out. We made a little video. You can see the uh, people that Rish is trying to do his impressions of. And you can decide how well he did. And then you can write hateful comments because that's what you do on a YouTube video. Yeah, that's a good point. I ooh, I can't even imagine going to YouTube. YouTube is the worst of the worst. I, I think I used to complain that the IMDB comments attracted the lowest common denominator, but that was before they dug a hole below where the lowest common denominator was, and that hole was called YouTube. Yeah, there's uh, even parodies. I don't know if you've ever seen that uh, Muppets video where Beaker is trying to sing a song and then the comments start popping up worst song ever you know how you get because they do that on youtube where you comment actually comes up on the video and you have to x it off yeah i don't like click that. the x yeah they start appearing all over and beaker sees them and he's like ah! <laughs> and he gets more and more upset as each bad comment comes up and then he i think he slits his own throat at the end and the blood goes in slow motion if, if that sort of thing is happening, they need to police the YouTube user comments. Because you can just get on there and say, Wanko Rotary Engine. And no one stops you. That's I, <coughs> You could even say that. And I, I don't know that they would do anything about it. It's just it's, uh, so much ugly crap. But if you put like a URL or it's like, five, buy Viagra here. Surely they'd remove that, right? I don't know, man. That would be actual effort. All they do is have bots that are set up to see if you're trying to steal somebody else's content. And then they shut your video down if that's the case. Hmm. Does the Dune Steve have a YouTube account? Big Anklevich has a YouTube account that Dune Steve things are posted on. Okay, that's cool. Such as karaoke videos I need to put more stuff up there and just that karaoke video you still have all those <laughs> photographs from the Transformers movie I don't think so I think they died years ago maybe when my hard drive died that one time because I thought well maybe I could make a video of that with all those photographs because we still have the audio and there's a new Transformers movie <laughs> that's true you know what would be really neat is if no one went. If they had a war and no one came? Yeah, I think that would be neat. Um, So back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't like surfers much, do you? Or is it the surfing talk you don't like? 
Or is it just the turtles that you don't like? I don't like the turtles. Why don't you like the turtles? Because but why surfers? are they surfers? Isn't that, that's not, not part talking, of their name. I'm not talking Ninja Turtles. I'm talking the turtles from Nemo. You have a thing against. <gasps> I do. Uh, well, a the turtle from Nemo. Yeah, the kid's fine. Uh huh. But he says gnarly and righteous and stuff. Mm. <laughs> so it's not the gnarly and righteous. It's just that. Again, is there's so much to love about that movie and why they would focus on that one <laughs> thing that the movie is not about. I don't know. So you don't dislike surfers or surfer talk? Just those particular I dislike turtles. the Andrew Stanton character in Finding Nemo, yes. Uh -huh. But you also dislike the Ninja Turtles, who talk like surfers, although they're not necessarily surfers. But I think I've seen them skateboarding, but I don't think they've ever surfed, have they? I do remember them skateboarding, yeah. I, uh, I They don't... could probably surf on their shells, right? But that wouldn't be very cool. Could the Ninja Turtles do that? Could they, like, regular turtles, like, pull their arms in and their heads in and be... Just a shell. Well, I, on the cartoon, I could imagine that happening. But Didn't they, they have that happen in the movie once where, like, he pulls his head down and they, like, swing the knife at it, his sword at his head or something? And they why are you asking me? I, I, I've never <laughs> seen any of this stuff. Or... Uh, I guess this is a side note. Uh, I was just trying to find out if you dislike surfers in general. Do you like Spicoli? You no. like Fast Times at Ridgemont High, though. No, I but dislike... But that's because the, of Phoebe Cates. I dislike the Spicoli character quite a bit. Yeah. I'm, I'm much more of a Mr. Hand fan. Mr. But... Hand was my math teacher in 11th grade. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. He had a coffee cup that was the most disgusting thing I had ever seen. It was a white coffee cup on the outside. But it was so stained... On the inside, that you would never have known that it was ever white before. I don't know how long the guy had been using that mug, but he really needed to update it. Sorry, back to your Mr. Hand. <laughs> Ray Walston played the teacher, Mr. Hand, that Spicoli was constantly disrupting the class of. Mm -hmm. You know, they had like a, you know, a battle of wills throughout that movie. And apparently the Spicoli character spoke to a ton of people around that time and the ne'er-do-well judge reinhold character spoke to me a lot more than that and plus and the, yeah and the nerdy jewish kid that goes after that you know that is in love with uh, jennifer jason lee that that kid spoke to me it's just that the cool kids rarely do so. uh-huh so you didn't like ferris bueller I, I i related a hell of a lot more to cameron than to to <laughs> ferris but uh anyway so it's not surfers. Wait, what? Oh, and it's you're, not ninjas. You're asking me what I don't like. But you didn't like Spicoli. You didn't like Ninja Turtles. You didn't like Crush. Are are Ninja Turtles really surfers? Well, they yeah. talk like surfers, and they do ninja ninjutsu, which all surfers did. Do. Spicoli do ninja? Yes. You don't remember that scene? Maybe that's why you don't like Spicoli as much, because you never saw the part where he does the ninjutsu. I guess I didn't. You I always I, fell I, asleep at the wrong moment, right. I guess. Well, I was spent after the uh, earlier scene. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what other examples of surfers are there that are famous? I don't know. Was, was Frankie Avalon a surfer in those beach blanket bingo movies? I suppose so. Yeah. Did, did you like the beach blanket bingo movies? No. Okay, so you don't like that either. Did you like the Beach Boys? They sang about the surfing ah, safari. The Beach Boys sang about surfing. And Surfing USA and Little Surfer Girl. You don't like any of those songs, do you? I do, actually. You only like She's Real Fine, My 409, and Sloop John B., huh? Okay. And <laughs> Little Deuce Coop. Only the songs about cars, none of the songs about surfing, huh? Okay. Oh, I remember you did say you really liked the big old Woody song, if I remember right. Is it really a big old Woody song? <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> that would be so rad. How much fun could be had. But they do sing about Woody's. Oh, yes, they do. It seems like there's a line about the Woody in the uh, We're Waxing Down Our Surfboards We Can't Wait for June song. Are you sure it's not waxing down our woodies? <laughs> yeah, so you do. Scented oil and shredded cheese. <laughs> so you do like the Beach Boys then? 
Yeah, if if you don't like the Beach Boys, then get out. Do you like Dick Dale? <sighs> Not really. No, anything you like, I don't like. But I I can't hate Dick Dale entirely because that was the whole marketing for uh, Pulp Fiction was that Dick Dale song. And you love and Pulp Fiction. I always think of Pulp Fiction whenever I hear Dick Dale. It's it, they're inextricably linked in my mind. Right. Yeah, I don't know that I'd ever heard of Dick Dale before Pulp Fiction, but yeah, he existed, it turns out, before then. So that's neat. I saw Dick Dale in concert by chance one time. He was at the Warped Tour the one year that I went to it. The Vans Warped Tour? Yes. Yeah, it was interesting because, you know, it was all like Blink-182 and no FX and... Pennywise and stuff like that. And then right there in the middle of that was this guy that's like 30 years older than everybody else that was there just playing surfer rock. And everybody was so hip on it because Pulp Fiction had just come out a couple of years before and they were all into that one song. Cool. Nobody liked any of his other songs, but... But you did. At least he had one song. It's more than me. Yeah, it's more than some people. Uh, At some point, we probably ought to talk about Clay's story, but uh, before that... So do you hate... (laughs) We're just plumbing the depths of your hate here, just seeing how deep it runs. Okay. Do you hate people? Um, Yeah, I think so. Okay. It's fair to say. Do you hate all animals or just certain animals? Just one animal, really. Yeah. Is it manimal? No, I quite liked Manimal. Is it Mant? <laughs> Define Mant for me. Okay, he's half man, uh-huh. half ant. Uh-huh. Mant. Oh, I think I, I, I understand now. Mant. What could Manimal do? He could become a panther. He could become a, an, a hawk, a falcon, I believe. He could become a... Armadillo? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, I guess he could become any animal. He could. But he just it would always cool be ones. like the, the these three that he would be in, in each episode. And we read somewhere that the, that's one of the animation studios, like the one that made the Sony Animation Studio or something, is doing a manimal CG animated feature film. That can't be true. We did not read that, did we really? Oh, all right. Do you remember there, there was a night that we wasted like a full hour just looking up? Okay, so who <laughs> made Hoodwinked? Who made Over the Hedge? Who made? I remember? do remember that. And we found that Manimal was being made into it. Why would anyone do that? I don't know. We're always talking about that. You know, they have to take something that people love, you know, to remake it. It's never a remake of a bad movie. There's like, oh, that's why I'm always saying that they need to remake Chud. Because it's a bad movie, but it had a really cool premise. A good uh-huh. movie is in there. Ones that had potential is what they should remake and find that potential. Yeah. But but that... instead, they take the ones that were really successful and they crap it up. Yeah. You know, they miss the point or they, they, they it's too much of a carbon copy or... I mean, they, there's got to be a good formula to a remake. A, a, a formula to a good remake, I guess. But what the formula it is, no one would be able to agree on. Because you can't just Xerox the original movie. And and yet, you, if you stray too far, where it becomes that in name only, that I think it upsets people too. It's just, just I, I would so much rather... We had a whole episode where we talked about unnecessary sequels, but I would so much rather see an unnecessary sequel than a remake of something. Just yeah, I think I would agree with you for sure on that. So was Sylvester Stallone? No, he wasn't in... Trying to find a way back to where we were supposed to be. Oh, okay. Well, Sylvester yeah. Stallone also appeared in today's story because it was one of the assigned words. Why do you think somebody picked that as an assigned word? You said somebody got George Lucas? Yes. It's Michael, Michael Jackson. Jackson was one. I don't think it was me that threw those names into the hat, the the, the actual proper names. But it, that's difficult. If all you have to do is just say, you know, that he was watching a Stallone movie on the TV when the phone rang, then that's easy. But to actually make it an integral part of the story, like Clay did, 
that's a challenge. And uh, I think he did a really good job too. Probably, and I I know the other stories that we we're already mentioning because I read them. It turns out. I would say, and no offense to anyone else who had one of these words, but I think Clay probably did the best job of actually incorporating that particular uh, craziness into his story. That was pretty impressive, the way he worked that in there, I would say. And, he I mean, he could have had more. He could have had Doc Brown and Spicoli uh, as words and still managed to work them in. Well, yeah, Andromeda Galaxy, Hallucinogen, and... Uh... Sylvester Stallone. It, it, it's hard for me to even imagine another what else you could do with the story. But <laughs> yeah, it had to be this. Story. But the surfer dude's thing was uniquely Clay. That came from him, not from the three words. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the 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 title is so brash and unapologetic. Just the surfer dudes, dudes from outer space, space, space. That, from uh, outer space. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I have to admire that he just jumped in with both feet on that, and it's it really embraced the the ludicrousness of the the scenario, and, and just the it's a fun story, I think. And yeah, when you have a humorous story, you can go for those kind of titles much more so. You don't have to come up with like light, like knives scraping down my back. As your title, instead you can. That's my in. second favorite uh, Alan Parsons project. <laughs> there, but, I, but yeah, it's it's fun to do fun stories. I had to do fun stories more often. My uh, my ideas aren't generally fun. No, mine aren't either. I, I mean, maybe there are a couple in there, but I, I I don't know. Clay in his author's note made it sound like he doesn't do a lot of fun stories or uh, humorous stories, and so. It's cool that we got him to do something outside his comfort zone. And it, it's, it's as a writer, it's good to work outside your comfort zone, I guess. Uh huh. I don't know. I, I tend to end up writing the same genres over and over again. And at this point, I don't even care, you know, if that makes me limited or any of that stuff. It's just the alternative is not writing. <laughs> I don't know if that's the only alternative. Writing a different for, genre. For me, the alternative is not writing. <laughs> Maybe that's something that we uh, maybe we maybe we should force that to be the uh, deal in our next contest. We could say you must write a humorous story about this. That would make it really tough. You don't know what you think? It would. Uh, and again, humor is in the ear of the beholder. I maybe it would be like a RoboCop story where it comes in with just blood squibs like crazy, and they're just like, "Wow." This not sure if this is humorous. He's like, oh, are you kidding me? Oh, my gosh, it's so funny. Uh... Well, yeah, and that's, that's the case. Some of the things that we do may make some people laugh and other people it just annoys. And, and that's fine. But, yeah, if we did a contest where it had to be humorous, you know, that seems like a real challenge. It seems like more of a challenge than it has to be a scary story. But maybe not. Because fear is in the eye of the beholder too, right? Yeah, that's true. A story about moths oh, might you. be scary to some, but not to others. A story about evil balloons <laughs> <laughs> might be scary to some, but not to others. No, I don't think an evil balloon's scary to anybody. I'm sorry, that just doesn't work. I think somebody said that your story scared them. I like that. They were lying. They were just trying to make me feel good. Well, did it work? No. Oh. I can't feel good. It's just not in my nature. All right. Well, now I see why we were friends. <laughs> I uh, did want to mention that we are making a lot of episodes recently. And that... things are actually going well into the future, too. We've got episodes, like, ready to go, which is pretty cool, too. Yeah. One time, Brian Lincoln asked us which was more likely, that we would do a story in the second person, that we would do a poem on the show, or that we would be weekly as a show. And, you know, I think two of those things seem at least somewhat likely for, well, by the time this is aired, we did those three episodes in a row and Lazarus in the Tank. 
That that was close to weekly, right? Something like that, yeah. The funny thing is, we've done a story in the second person, and we've done a poem before. So uh-huh. there's that. Okay. It was a short poem, but it was a poem nonetheless. I have a bad feeling that there's another poem out there somewhere. No. Just waiting in the wings. It's waiting for us to lower our guards. No. To become distracted by what's going on to the side of us so we don't look directly ahead. Never. Okay. Well, you just keep your guard up. <laughs> I'll do my best. <laughs> hey, so thank you, Clay Duggar, for uh, entering this into the contest. Thank you for everybody who donates to the show. Right? Do do people still donate to the show? The last time I looked at, at our PayPal balance, I vomited. Where did it all go? <laughs> but, oh, uh, it all went into the uh, New Media Expo coffers. Yeah. Um, people do still donate, but they could continue, or if they don't, they could donate more. I don't know what the right way to say that is, but that would definitely was not it. Um, but yeah, so we would be very grateful if you did donate. So that would be awesome. And there's a button right on the site that you can donate with. You can yeah. donate five a month, five a quarter, or just pick your own number and just donate once. Hey, uh, if 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 you if people want to subscribe to donate like once a month or once a quarter or whatever, there is, I recently recorded my favorite short story by my favorite author for a rich outcast to give to people who are subscribers to the Dune Steve. So if 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 you if you're interested in finding out what that is, that's the only way you'll be able to hear it, folks. Unless I upload it to YouTube, because apparently that's okay. <laughs> um, it's probably a Rich Outfield story, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Even if it were, it was like, what's my favorite story? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. And and as far as since we're talking about all that kind of stuff, also on our website, we got little buttons that you can click on to you can go and see. I think you can only see my blog because Rich doesn't have a button to his blog. All right. But we each have a blog that you could follow if you would like to. doesn't have a button either. <laughs> And also, we're on Facebook and Twitter. You could be our friends or our follower, I think it is, on Twitter. And we post things about the show and just about any old BS that comes to our minds sometimes on those. Um, We have forums. And there is also the forums that you can discuss this episode previous episodes or anything that you would like you could join in the movie quote game which is the longest running never ending thread on the forums and uh what else do we have anything else they can go to itunes if they want and write a review of us or give us stars that's true and oh also we have the that gets my goat podcast, which we never promote on this show for some reason, and some people don't even know that it exists, which I think is interesting. But it's a it's a podcast which is basically the same as what you get with this, but no story, just missing the story to change it from being a regular Dune Steve episode to being a that gets my goat, and that's not always a hundred percent true because we have run a couple of stories on there. Yeah, yeah not I, th- very I can many. think of like four we've run on. And on top of that, Rish has his Rish Outcast, and I have my Ankle Cast that you could listen to as well. And Rish now does a Star Wars podcast. Don't we have a Star Wars podcast promo to play? Do you really want to? After all, all this time. Hells yeah! All right, play it, R2. Hello, this is C-3PO, Human Cyborg Relations, and this is my counterpart, R2-D2, the astromech droid you all know and love, despite not having half the personality I do. Yes, yes, it is in human nature to anthropomorphize animals and objects, projecting their own feelings upon them, and I suppose they have done so with you. Of course you are still an individual, R2. I wasn't saying you weren't, but I was created to emulate humanity. And you were not, yet you remain more beloved than I. I doubt it is because I talk too much, R2. I really do. Oh, yes, yes. I was getting to that. We are here to introduce the Delusions of Grandeur podcast, 
a new show dedicated to Star Wars conversation. <laughs> oh, I have no idea why the world would need a new Star Wars podcast, R2. It's beyond my programming to speculate on human flights of fancy. Oh, many more than that, I'm sure. I calculate that there are currently 221 podcasts dedicated solely to Star Wars, with an additional 706 covering science fiction and fantasy, which encompasses Star Wars, and three that focus solely on humans having sexual relations with Wookiees and Yasm and droids and Minox. <coughs> yes, and whatever Yoda is. Thank you, R2. The point I'm trying to make is that there are so many, why would they ever listen to a new one? Really? You think that might work? Very well, R2. The uniqueness of Delusions of Grandeur comes from its hosts, Marshall Latham and Rish Outfield, and the various guests they will invite on the show each month. Hopefully, the conversations will be insightful, and the jokes relatively amusing. Oh, see, R2, they didn't believe me. Very well. You may judge for yourself over at www.delusionsofgrandeurpodcast.blogspot.com. Come, R2. I'll treat you to an oil bath. No, I mean an oil bath. What do you mean, innuendo? Oh, R2. <laughs> Wait, you played the wrong message, R2. That was the dirty one. <laughs> Yeah, see, I think you were set up for a much dirtier one. Maybe I should write like a really, yeah, make really it dirty super one. raunchy. It's just all awful. If and the only podcast it can run on is that Nobilis Erotica podcast. It's so dirty. See, I should start listening to that. <laughs> that seems cool. Uh, if you have a podcast and you'd like to run that promo on there, uh, just let us know. I'll send it to you. That's fine. Or we we should post it someplace so people can just grab it and play it if they want. Oh, I'm tired. I don't know why. You do seem a little lower energy than usual, I'll have to admit. We didn't get a soda at lunch that much. Oh, be. stupid water. Why would we just drink water? Because that's all you can drink. Why do I do that? I don't know. Sometimes you promised I wonder. Buddha that you would only drink water. Yeah, it's weird. It's a, it was supposed to help me lose weight, but I haven't lost any weight since I started doing that. Not a pound. I've gained probably more weight than I've lost since I started doing that. What a dumb idea. I need to go get a Mountain Dew right now. That's right. Let's do that. Let's let, In fact, let's sign off. So All right. We can get so a we can go Dew. get one. All right. Well, thanks for listening, everybody. And uh, have a good week. We'll see you again next time. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. And party on, dude. Yeah. Be excellent to each other. Oh! I never asked you if you hated... Those aren't surfers. But they talk like them. No, but... They but talk like people from California. There's I, a difference. Uh. The Dune Steep is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can share the show with whomever you'd like, but you cannot charge for it or alter the show. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs>is a chalupa head. Do we ever have it about the author with these ones, darn it? No, we don't, but we can just... <laughs> and then you read the about the author, and I'll say, all right, so there you have it. Now I can bring up those actual question answers. Yeah, now you've cleared them. <laughs> You'll never find... i got to search. As long as you live. Oh, damn you. Surfer dudes. I like to crap. <laughs> really? It's good to know. Um, so back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, not back to the show. Back to the outtakes. Um, they had a thing, and I think I want to say it was the honest trailers like one of the links that you can click on was the top 10 most underwhelming movies that people were really excited about before they came out oh that would be interesting but like phantom menace phantom menace was number one obviously it was the big winner 
and they even talked about how everybody went to see it and loved it and then after a while they started to realize just how bad it was yeah i don't i don't imagine that that will ever be topped the anticipation for episode seven no matter how big they make it it's nothing the same yeah but yeah, like Transformers Revenge of the Fallen was on there. That's the second one? Yeah, that's what I thought. That's a I was like, really, really shitty one. I was just like, how could that have been so anticipated when the first one was crap? How can it be that much of a letdown when the first one was crap? Didn't quite work. But yeah, they had... What else did they have on there? Indiana Jones and Crystal Skull hmm. was one. I can't remember what else. It wasn't an amazing list, but I thought that I would mention that because of the Transformers thing. Okay, uh, back to the... No, over not back the to weekend, show. Catching Fire passed uh, Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Man's Chest for the... That was the second one yeah, or the third one? For the number 10 bi- uh, biggest money-making film of all time. Really? And I just... I, I, I was just like, Really? Nobody talks about Catching Fire. Yeah, Nobody. I know. No, I, I, I mean it, man. People talked a lot about Hunger Games when it came out. Nobody says anything about Catching Fire. Is, is it ahead of Hunger Games, yeah. Catching Fire? Yeah, it passed Iron Man 3 as the biggest movie of 2013. But to be in the top 10 of all time, again, it's just telling us those numbers mean nothing. Yeah. I mean, sure, it's probably successful, but I, I wouldn't even call it a blockbuster hit. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. if it's the number one movie of the year, that's something at least, I guess. I guess, but it's, it's not a phenomenon. Frozen is a friggin' phenomenon. Yeah. Way bigger deal than, <laughs> Dude. than Catching Fire. Okay, well, you, you're smart. Bigger deal, Catching Fire or Frozen? I would say Frozen is, but... The first one eclipses Catching Fire by in all respects. I, people are always talking about what, how amazing it is that Frozen continues to make that much money. It was number three at the box office this last weekend. Number three, like 11 weeks later. Is Catching Fire even in the top 10? I don't I know. Just, I, I somebody somewhere is lying. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'll go see it when it gets to movies eight, but if it's as big a deal as they're lying. Uh, it'll be impossible to get into it. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, we haven't seen it yet either. Although we did read it. And uh, they saw the first one. That was on Netflix just recently, so easy to see. But, oh, yeah, did I tell you about that? You did. I couldn't sit through it. I had to get up and just, I'm like, ugh, no, I'm, I'm going to go take a shower because I'm getting sick. Yeah, getting we have had that notes. conversation. It, it ruined a movie that otherwise was probably pretty good. I, yeah. The storytelling in it was fine. It was just the freaking stupid camera work was terrible. I hate, hate, hate that style. From what I understand, the new one's not like that. Maybe that's why it made more money than the first one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It's the tenth biggest movie of, of all time without me contributing to it at all. All right, back to the show. I guess so. So you didn't like Ferris Bueller? I I, I related a hell of a lot more to Cameron than to to <laughs> Ferris. But uh, hey, did, have you ever heard that strange, that silly theory that? Ferris Bueller doesn't actually exist, and that he's uh, Cameron has had you know some kind of psychotic break, and invented like this perfect friend that's always there for him, and you know gives him all the best suggestions and gets away with everything, and it it it, may, it holds no water whatsoever with the film itself. You uh, know, similar to that, I was surfing on YouTube, and I was like, righteous. No, I just. <laughs> I found this video, and I don't know, I can't remember how I wound up, but it was Full House, but as if the guy who was the father of the the, the baby that was played by the, the Olsen twins, mm-hmm. as if this guy had had a breakdown and imagined this baby, and the baby didn't actually exist. And they showed, like, the opening 
credits and they showed all the people and then it got showed the spot where like the baby's supposed to be sitting in the car seat or whatever in the back and the car seat's just empty they like gone in and actually like digitally removed the baby and like it gets to the part where it shows her name and it's just like a blank room and the name doesn't ever come up and I gotta it's just see a blank this. shot everywhere you go and then it goes to like the start of the show and he comes walking in and in the show, he's actually holding the baby, but they've again digitally removed the baby. <laughs> so he's acting like he's holding a baby. And then he like says something about the about the baby, and then the da- the real daughter says something, and then it, it's silent, and the baby just is not there. And then everybody laughs. Ah, it was the weirdest thing. I want to see it that. It seemed like it would be funny, but then I watched it and it just it didn't turn out as funny as I Oh, I the way you're describing it is really funny. But you can check it out and see. Maybe, you maybe you know, like everybody has different opinions of funniness. Full House is one of the shittiest shows ever made, by the way. Just in case you were wondering. Okay. It makes Family Matters look like MASH, folks. <laughs> Wait, no, what's a show that I actually like? It, ma- it makes family matters look like roots. It makes family matters look like the Cosby Show. Do you remember when the Cosby Show was like the freaking yeah, of course I do number one show in the land? It was such a big deal that on the Growing Pains show, they went to a taping of the Cosby Show. That was actually one of the things they did. They went and sat in the audience. They were part of the live studio audience of the Cosby show on the growing pains. You you make yourself sound old when you call it the growing pains. Groin pains. Groin pains. That's right. Oh, sorry. I was That's confused. actually the correct name of the show. Sorry. <laughs> We had a whole episode where we talked about unnecessary sequels, but I would so much rather see an unnecessary sequel than a remake of something. Yeah, I think I would agree with you for sure on that. Somebody was just talking about the new RoboCop movie, telling me about how badly they missed the point of that. Did you have any interest in seeing that? Not really. I was never a big fan of the original movie. I think I may have been slightly too young for that movie when it came out. Okay. One of those that was kind of aimed at a certain age level, and I just wasn't at it, and so it just didn't do it for me. Or maybe I'm just not callous enough to laugh at the people being, because that was a really bloody movie. It was. I, I saw one of those unnecessary trailers where they were doing a. They they started out like we're going to do a review of the RoboCop movie, and they're like, nah, we won't bother with a stupid new one. Let's do the old one that people liked. Mm-hmm. And then yeah, they talked about how. I can't remember if they did it, the starring thing, which I always think is funny at the end, where they say, starring this person and this person. They come up with funny names for them all. Uh-huh. And then I think they said, and the most blood squibs <laughs> ever. And they just did this huge m- montage of all the blood squibs exploding out of people everywhere in that movie. Well, I, honestly, I, a lot of the appeal of RoboCop was the violence. Uh-huh. Um, you know, it was made in the 80s as sort of a commentary of the violent action movies of the 80s and how that might continue in the future. It's like, here's here's a future version of what you guys like right now, where it was, you know, we'd taken the violence up to like a 14 on a 10 scale. Uh-huh. And it, it, the funny thing is I, I was at the age where it's just like, oh, my gosh, this violence is rad. <laughs> And then when I saw it again as an adult, the violence bothered me. But as a kid, it never did. Mm-hmm. That's strange to to have to have that happen, to become sensitized to something. Because, you know, well, the people things... will talk and they will say that you can be desensitized to something. Yeah, but things have changed kind of too, though, from those days to these days. I mean, you don't see movies like that very much anymore because... Because Verhoeven has retired. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It became like a cool thing. I think it started with what, wasn't it the, uh, like, Peckinpah and, and the Wild Bunch sort of a thing where they started to try and really go for it with the violence. And the. I remember seeing a comedy sketch 
from Monty Python where they were doing like a movie review thing and they're like, oh, and we're going to review the latest Peckinpah film entitled Buckets of Blood Pouring Out of People's Heads. They would do stuff joking about that kind of thing all the time. They had a movie that they were shooting called Scott of the Antarctic. And every time he killed a lion and the lion would fall down and the blood would go in slow motion. I think that's where it kind of started. And it just kind of increased and increased. And then, I don't know, maybe at some point people said, you know what, this is probably not a good idea. That whole desensitizing thing, maybe it's real. And so they... See, but I just made an argument for the opposite, that it's not real. Sort of, but... So F them. If it went away and you didn't see it anymore, like I was trying to say, in the 90s and through till now, it kind of, most of that really violent stuff went away. It's like Pulp Fiction is one of the last really well, Right, violent. Tarantino is one of the few bastions of the, the uber-violent cinema. But no, the explanation is the the almighty PG-13. That's where it all went. Right. When people realized that a Die Hard movie rated PG-13 made more than an R-rated Die Hard movie, filmic integrity was jettisoned. Right. Um, When I heard that this RoboCop remake was PG-13, yeah, I sort of rolled my eyes because it's like, well, that's... That was a lot of the point of the first RoboCop was the excess of that movie. And then the also the, the social commentary. They're commentating on entertainment and television and violence and, and crime and all that stuff. And, and from what I've heard, that is entirely absent from the remake. Uh, they do try and touch on a couple of, of other topics, which, you know, is laudable, I guess. But. Yeah, that's that's something that I really, really remember fondly from the first RoboCop was the you know like the fake commercials, and yeah, the stuff that the people watched for the board game pro- called Nukem. Yeah, it, and it was it was lampooning that '80s Reagan Thatcher culture of entertainment. And can you lampoon what's going on in the world today? I I, I, I can't even imagine it. I'm sure you could. Whether it would work well like it did then or not, I don't know. So was Sylvester Stallone? No, he wasn't in RoboCop. I was trying to find a way back to where we were supposed to be. Oh, okay. Well, Sylvester yeah. Stallone was in some of those 80s action movies, and he also appeared in today's story because it was one of the assigned words. I was about to say, giant slugs, maybe they were just fat. <laughs> He could see the two very well. No. He couldn't see the two very well. Right. <laughs> oh. It's after midnight. Come on, give me a break. He could... <laughs> I almost did it wrong. Again. Could he see the two very well? <laughs> he couldn't, okay? Moving on. Their fire was very low. Greedy and lazy. <laughs> I'm just still on top. Yo, dudes, uh, why I gotta come in here looking for you all the time? Is that Sorry. Schwarzenegger or Stallone? <laughs> I'm not very good at Schwarzenegger, but he has that really, really dumb sounding voice. Was that Clark Kent? Man, I love that dude! Okay, uh, tell me one time, how does Stallone talk? He's greedy and lazy! Yo, Adrian, was hey, that yo, Clark the... Kent? Yeah! I, the I, end. We might have to find somebody to do Stallone better. I. I... Nice one, 08OT.